Amen. I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to open them to the book of James, James chapter 4. Some of you in here might have heard of the, the story of the snake and the saw. I had heard this recently. I don't know if it's true or not, uh, but it's, it's about a snake that slithers into uh, a gardening shop or a, a tool shop and, and into a shed, and it, it, it's, it's moving along on the ground in this, in this tool shed. It, it brushes up against a saw, and the saw cuts it. And the snake, after getting this pain of this cut, it, it strikes at the saw, and of course, as it strikes the saw and bites the saw, it gets cut again. And so the snake is angry because it thinks the saw is a threat, obviously, and so it wraps around the saw, and as it wraps around the saw, of course, it gets cut over and over again. And so as it's feeling this pain and this, this frustration and this anger at the saw, it squeezes it harder to try to... To, to constrict and to kill the saw, and it squeezes and it squeezes and squeezes. And anybody who knows the story, what, what happens in the end? What happens? Yeah, the, the snake, I mean, for people like me, we'd say this is a happy ending because nothing happens to the saw, but the snake dies as it constricts over the saw and it gets cut in half. We could look at that story and we could say that's really a good analogy for us because the reality is, this is true for us too, conflict that leads to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, it only destroys You See, the snake, if it would have just simply let go of that initial pain, if it would have just simply moved on, nothing would have happened. It would have healed from that little cut. Everything would have been fine. But instead, the snake squeezed more and more and it didn't want to give up and it didn't want to let go and it led to its death. Conflict so often does that for us. See, sometimes all we have to do is let go. Sometimes, by the grace of God, if we just let go and we go on, by the grace of God, everything's fine. And that's what followers of Jesus do ultimately. If we follow Jesus, we let go of things, we forgive, we don't hold on to bitterness and resentment. The book of James is a letter, as we get ready to read in chapter 4, I want to, because we're just jumping into chapter 4, I want to give a, a little bit of a background. If you were here, probably, I don't know, it's been six, seven years ago or so, we, we went through the book of James together. But James is a letter to help us understand that proving genuine faith, what that really looks like. So what, what proves that someone's a sincere follower of Jesus? James talks about that throughout this letter. Actions that prove Christian faith to be sincere. What proves your faith to be real? And, and how should we respond in difficulties like this? And so we're going to read chapter 5, just the first four verses. And James helps us to see when we deal with things like this conflict, how do we respond? What does a follower of Jesus do in response? So let's look at these first five verses here. It says, What is the source of the wars and the fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly so that you may spend it on your desires for pleasure. Adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Or do you think it's without reason the scripture says that the spirit he has caused to live in us yearns jealously? Father, we pray for wisdom this morning as we consider this truth from your word, that you would help us to understand, that you would help us to apply it rightly to our lives, that you would help us, Father, to not simply be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word, as James so clearly reminds us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're beginning a new series this morning, a new four-week sermon series that's going to take us through this month on, on how to talk to people. And specifically, we're going to be thinking about how, as followers of Jesus, how do we handle conflict and how do we speak to others in the midst of that conflict? Anger by itself, for example, is not sinful. So to simply be angry is not sinful. I mean, think about it. God has been and is angry often because God gets angry at sin. We should be angry with sin. And so it wouldn't have been wrong for the snake to say, ouch, that hurt, that, that, I'm, I'm upset that that cut me. But then the problem, though, is that anger so often 
Even though in and of itself is not sinful, it so often leads to sinful. It can be sinful because it causes us to to respond to unresolved conflicts. They consume us. That results in bitterness and jealousy and unforgiveness and resentment and all these things that are sinful because we're angry and we won't let go of that anger and we don't respond to that anger rightly. So today I want us to consider why all of the conflict. When we think about What's going on? Why, why can't, you know, they're all saying, why can't we all just get along? You know, why is that? Why can't we? We know the simple answer, we could just end this sermon now, which we're not going to, sorry, but we could just say sin. That's the answer, okay? Shut your Bibles, go home, time to leave. The answer is sin. Yes. So what? But, but specifically, let's go a little deeper than that. Why all the conflict? Why is there so much conflict in our country? Why is there so much conflict in our community? Why is there so much conflict in our relationships? Why? Why all the conflict? We know that conflicts typically come, if, we, if we're to be honest, it comes from our selfish desires being at odds with others' desires, and more importantly, being at odds with God's desires. That's really the source of conflict. And so my purpose in the message today is that you will understand the reasons for conflict and trust God for help. In other words, let's, let's be real for a moment this morning and just think about, okay, why the conflict in my life? And I'm going to ask God, I'm going to trust God to help me deal with this the right way. And so James tells us that our conflicts go back to our inward desires, our tendency to, 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 you know, to, to fulfill those desires in a way that ignores the needs of others and excludes God and his desire to provide for our needs. That's, that's one of the reasons that we have so much conflict. And James addresses this throughout his letter, but especially as we read here this morning in these five verses, No one in his right mind claims to have a life without conflict. None of us. I mean, if we're to be serious and and sincere this morning, we wouldn't say something like, well, I don't have any conflict in my life. Well, of course you do, Uh, right? We we are sinful people who regularly interact with other sinful people. So conflict is going to happen. We are sinners living in a world that is full of sin. Conflict is everywhere. Conflict is everywhere. Why, though? Why, why is that true? Why is it true that conflict is everywhere? And what can we do about it? What, what, what should we do about it? These are questions that we'll be answering throughout this month, but I, I want to get a good start on it today so that when we go through this series, we can think through, okay, why the conflict and what do we do? And so let's consider three reasons for heartbreaking conflict. Three reasons that we'll look at these three reasons as is clear in the passage we read. And then we'll consider our necessary response. These are the reasons, some of the reasons for conflict. Okay, those are the reasons, so what should we do? How can we understand these and then then how can we trust God for his help? How can we grow closer to him and then as a result of growing closer to him, further away from continuous conflict in our lives? Or at least further away from tragically being impacted by that conflict, right? We're not going to just say, well, conflict can be avoided, right? No, we can't avoid all conflict. Conflict is inevitable, but our sinfulness in response to the conflict can be avoided as we trust trust the Father to help us through those situations. And so these are three issues that, that, that really are ways that we fail and then long-lasting, devastating conflict follows. And so let's, let's be better as followers of Jesus. Let's do better. The first reason for heartbreaking conflict, as we saw in this passage, is that we're not seeking God. Seeking God solves a lot of things, doesn't it? I mean, in fact, if we're sincere, what isn't solved by seeking the Lord? Really, in our lives, what isn't solved if we would just simply seek after the Lord, seek to serve him and to honor him and to be faithful to him? No, it doesn't mean that there will be no conflict. I'm not saying that if you would just seek the Lord, you won't have conflict in your life. No, of course there will still be conflict. But if we seek the Lord and we're interacting with sinners and we're sinners and we know that there's still going to be conflict, if we seek the Lord, that helps us avoid or at least rightly deal with the heartbreak that can come from that conflict. And the more we seek the Lord together, think about this, the more we seek the Lord together, the less conflict we have. How many fights were there this morning during the worship music time? I didn't see any, did you guys? Why? 
because we were seeking the Lord together. That's one of the beautiful things about corporate worship. You see, we could come in here and we could maybe be struggling, but then if we're sincere, now don't get me wrong, we could sing a song and in our minds and in our hearts be holding on to some sort of bitterness and not really be seeking the Lord. But if we're sincere and we come in together and, and we're sincerely seeking the Lord together as we sing to him and as we praise him, as we worship him, all of a sudden you're not inclined to turn to your neighbor and just punch him in the face. But when you go outside and you get upset about something, all of a sudden we see that sort of stuff. I'm not saying with you guys, but you know, you see that. But we don't do that when we sing. Why? Because we're seeking the Lord together. And that may be dumbing it down to something simple, but sometimes it really is that simple. Seek the Lord together, and that resolves so much conflict. The question of the sermon is right here in verse 1. If you look at verse 1 again, verse 1 it says, What is the source of wars and fights among you? Now think about that. That The the answer then is there too. The answer, it says, don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? So this war within them was literally talking about conflict in your members. And so depending on your translation, when it gets to the, the heart of the original language, it's talking about this war within the members. right? So remember, members, church membership comes from Paul's use of the word members of the body. We're members of the same body, all these different body parts that are all members of one another. And he says, so there's these wars with the members. I mean, think about how ridiculous it is that parts of my body would fight with other parts of my body. They don't do that. Why? Because we're seeking the same purpose. Underneath the headship, which is Christ is the head of the church, the head of the body, and we, we, as we work together and seek the Lord, then we don't war with one another. Because that would be insanity. If, if my right hand was fighting with my left hand and trying to hurt it, no, that doesn't happen. Why? Because we're united under the head that tells my body what to do. And so we as a church are united under Christ who tells us what to do. So the war within them was this conflict within the members. It's conflict in relationships with people in the body of Christ, which the Bible is clear is unacceptable. There's no place for that. And there were, as is true of all of us, evil, selfish desires that were causing problems in the church that James was addressing. And so one of the big big ones in the book of James that he was addressing, addressing is they were showing favoritism to the rich over the poor. So the pleasures of life, James addresses this here in chapter 4, the pleasures of life bring about heartbreaking conflict. Why? Because we seek them. We're seeking the pleasures. We're seeking the things that will give us selfish satisfaction rather than seeking the Lord. And so if, as I seek the things that'll, that'll pleasure me rather than seeking the Lord, what happens? That's going to lead to conflict because that's not what God has for me. So look at verse 2 for a continuation of the, of the, of the question or of the answer and the explanation. That this, so the question we saw in, in verse 1, why, why all this conflict? Why all the wars? Why all the conflict? And so he starts to answer, and then in verse 2 he continues, you desire and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight in war, you do not have because you do not ask. So in other words, instead of trusting and seeking God and relying on him and being content and satisfied in him, they were wanting what others had. Well, that doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? I mean, doesn't that just say what exactly we all struggle with? We, we covet what other people have because we're not satisfied with what God has given us. You see, wanting what others have is the same as telling God that he doesn't know what he's doing and providing for your needs. God, what you decided for my life isn't good enough. I want what he has. No. And so complaining about our circumstances is doing the same things. God, you don't know what you're doing. But he does. And so when we covet, when we want what someone else has and that leads to conflict, it's because we're not seeking the Lord, but instead seeking what we think would be better for us, even though God has the perfect plan. God knows what you need. God knows who he's created you to be. There is conflict because of our selfish sinfulness rather than a humble pursuit of holiness. Notice he even says that you murder. He says you murder and you covet. Why would he say you murder? Well, is it because there were murderers in the church that James was talking to? Probably not. Jesus set the bar high when he said that hatred is like murder. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, he said that if you hate your brother or sister, it's the same as murder. You are guilty of murder. 
John said the same thing in 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. So what he's saying here is, you either forgive and stop holding grudges, or you're not a follower of Jesus. That's a tough pill to swallow, but the Bible's clear on this. It's all over 1 John, it's in the, it's in the Sermon on the Mount, it's all over the Gospels as Jesus talks about forgiveness. If you hate, you're a murderer. Seek the Lord and ask for his help. Verse 3 says that you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your evil desires. Can't we all relate to this? I mean, shame on us when we're all about ourselves, we're all about our own happiness more than we are about the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. God, help us not to be that way. We have such heartbreaking conflict because we're not seeking God. Instead, we're being fools just like that snake and and we're keeping score. Oh, look what they did. I did. I would have never done that, but they did this. And we're, we're holding on to bitterness, ultimately hurting ourselves as we, as we hold on tighter and tighter. It just cuts us deeper and deeper. We, we got to let go. Because Jesus made it very clear, if, if we don't forgive others, then he doesn't forgive us. And if we're not forgiven, we don't have a right relationship with him. That's why we talk, and, and I think it's good timing this month, maybe as much as any other sermon series, as we next week take the Lord's Supper together, as we commune together, To remember that that's why we talk so much about this when we take communion, is that we can't come in a right relationship with God claiming that, but then holding on to bitterness towards someone else. That's why Paul is so clear about that in 1 Corinthians 11, that when we do that, we're eating and drinking judgment on ourselves. Why would he say that? Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive someone else, that you're not forgiven. And so if you claim to be in a right relationship with God, but you won't forgive your brother or sister or somebody else that's wronged you, and you come to the Lord's table, you're coming in an unworthy manner, and you're testing God, and you're drinking judgment on yourself. Don't do that. So let that be a warning now. You've got a week before next Sunday. Get that right. Talk to somebody if you need to talk to them. Forgive them if you need to forgive them. Ask for forgiveness if you need to be forgiven. Ask for help from a discipleship group like Jake talked about in his testimony video this morning and accountability and ask for prayer, whatever it needs so that you can make sure that you're walking with Christ, which includes walking with his church. The first reason for heartbreaking conflict is not seeking God. The second reason is not obeying God. Playing both sides is not an option. You you either obey God or you disobey God. Picking and choosing which parts to obey is simply disobedience. So in other words, if I pick out what of this I want, I'll take this, but I don't want this, then that's that's not obedience, that's disobedience. You either obey or you disobey. It's creating, if if I start to pick and choose, what that is is I'm creating my own God, and in a sense, I'm creating my own hell-focused religion. That's called a cult. And so when we start to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we want to obey, we're not being Christians. We're being idol worshipers who's creating our own Jesus, some false Jesus, some false God that we want to worship. It's creating that false religion. Jesus isn't a way. Jesus is the way. The Bible isn't a word. The Bible is the word of God. It's not just a suggestion, a word that we can try to decide which parts we want. And so verse 4 is abundantly clear when he says adulteresses. And so he's not saying that because all of them were having these extramarital affairs. He's saying that because they were abandoning the, 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 as the bride of Christ, the supposed bride of Christ, they were abandoning the groom, the Christ himself, who's the only way. And he was saying adulteresses, no, you can't do that. You're either with God or you're his enemy. You pick sides with the culture and the world standards and your non-Christian friends, then, then you're an enemy of God. That's it. You can't be both. That's why it always amazes me when someone professes to be a follower of Jesus, but then they say that their closest friends are unbelievers. 
How is that possible? Some of the closest friends I've ever had are unbelievers, but that was before I was a Christian. You see, because the moment I became a Christian, everything changed because everything about me changed. And so naturally, yes, we should still try to be friends with unbelievers. We should still have friendships with unbelievers. That's a problem if you don't have any friends who are non-Christians. You better have friends who are non-Christians. And you better love them and serve them and pray for them and be kind to them. We should do that. But how is it possible it, they can't be as close and as good of friends as believers in Jesus can be and should be? Because think about it. The most important thing about me, my relationship with Jesus, is not shared by someone who's not a follower of Jesus. And so right there, the very most important thing about me, without exception, they're, they're saying, no, I don't want that. But even if everything else about my brothers and sisters in Christ is different, if we are just total opposites and everything else, but we share the most important thing, a desire to follow Jesus, then that's enough. That's enough. How much less conflict might we experience if we truly understood and embraced this in our everyday lives? Too many people care more about what the world thinks than about what God thinks. Too much friendship with the world at the expense of disobeying the word of God. That's why we see in Paul's letter when he says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And he's talking in that situation about business transactions, kind of going into business with somebody. Because think about it, you're going into business with somebody and you have the value of honoring and bringing glory to Christ and this person says, no, let's cheat on our taxes. Well, how can you possibly do a business together And so Paul's like, no, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And of course, if it applies in business, it certainly applies in every other area of our life where we're going to have those close relationships, whether it's marriage or or intimate friendships, discipleship groups like Jake talked about. We just can't do that with unbelievers in the way that we can do it with believers. The reasons for heartbreaking conflict are not seeking God and not obeying God. The third reason is not trusting God. God, I mean, think about it. When you are sincerely trusting the Lord and looking to him, are you not less inclined to cause conflict with others? How many times were you trusting God in your life and then desired as a result to to cause conflict? No, I mean, that's not how it works. As we trust God, we don't desire the conflict. Are you not better able to handle the conflict the more you trust God? Are you not a, a better peacemaker the more you trust God. You see, when we fail to trust God as we should, we end up experiencing conflict. And not just with him, because that's the most important way we experience conflict, as we don't trust God, as we fail to trust God, as we don't trust God as we should. There's obvious conflict there because our relationship with God is not what it should be. But also with one another and with others when we're not trusting God. I mean, look at verse 5 again. It says, do you not think, or do you think it's without reason, the scripture says that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealously. If you know Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, he compels you to seek what is above. He yearns jealously because he alone is worthy of your sold-out devotion and worship. Remember, we've talked about this before. We, We see that word jealous and we think, well, that's a bad thing. How could God be jealous? Because he's worthy of it. And so you would not say it's a bad thing for me to be jealous for my wife that we only have the bond that we have with one another, right? We, we should desire that. If I didn't desire that, I'm not a good husband. And so that's a good jealousy. God is jealous for our devotion because he alone is worthy of our devotion, of our worship. And so if he wasn't jealous for that, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be worthy. Now, there's a lot of debate about this verse because some people would say when they look at the language, it's hard to to put it into English. Some people say, well, it actually might be saying God jealously longs for the spirit he made to live in us. In other words, the the spirit that we have, our soul, who we are, it belongs to him. But really, think about it, it doesn't matter. Both of those translations get to the same point. Conflict is the result of not trusting him. The Holy Spirit longs for us to be devoted to him in worship, and the spirit that he gave us is, belongs to God, and he longs for it to be devoted to him. So either way, the same thing is being said. God wants our worship. He wants our devotion. He made us for it. And if we don't have that, if we're not trusting him in that, then we have problems. 
We have a problem in our relationship with him, and that's going to impact our relationship with others. So think about this morning, what has your trust and your affections and your devotion? You know, it's election season, right? So in the midst of an election season, where are you putting your hope? Because we know what happens when we put it in the world. Now, where are you putting your hope? Maybe right now you're facing some conflict with someone else in some relationship, a friendship, a marriage, a coworker. You're facing conflict right now. What is your goal in that situation? As you think through that right now in your mind, you're thinking through that conflict that you're having, what's your goal? What do you want to happen? There are plenty of good things in the world, but where is your devotion? You see, our hope must be in the Lord, not in the government, not in our citizenship in this life, but our hope must be in the Lord. And our goal in those relationships, our goal in the midst of conflicts that we face must be reconciliation. Ron's going to talk about that next week. Our goal has to be reconciliation, being in a right relationship with God and in a right relationship with one another. And if you're experiencing some conflict right now and you don't desire reconciliation, there is a problem. And I just want to plead with you to cry out to the Lord because if you don't desire reconciliation to be in a right relationship, then I'm not sure how it's possible that the Holy Spirit dwells in you (laughs) because you should long for reconciliation no matter the situation. And if our ultimate devotion is to the Lord, he's going to help us to do that. Being devoted to him. Remember I said my purpose today is that you would understand the reasons for conflict and trust God for help. What's your response today? How are you handling conflict? How should you handle conflict? How should you talk to people? As we talk about in the sermon series, how should you talk to people in the midst of conflict? You'll get some good answers in the coming weeks, pursuing reconciliation next week, being quick to listen that Pastor Scott's going to be talking about, being a peacemaker. Rhett's going to be talking about that. Do you recognize that this is ultimately about a right relationship with God? That's where it has to start. If we are trusting and following him, only then will we rightly deal with conflict in our lives. Trust him for help. Prioritize your relationship with him. I love the response questions at the end of the, this morning's gospel project lesson, the one in the adult leader guide. It said, or, or in the student guide as well, but that, that last question, or one of the questions, I think it was the first one, it said, how high on your list of life goals is knowing Christ And what can you do about it? I mean, what a great question to ask yourself and be sincere in examining your heart, answering, do you know Christ? And how can you grow and be better? It all starts and continues with that. It starts with knowing Jesus. right? We know that God's plan from the very beginning was that we be in a right relationship with him. He's perfect, he's holy, and yet we know that we all sin, we all fall short of God's perfect plan, his design, his perfection, his holiness, and that sin leads to brokenness. And we all know what brokenness is because we see it all over the place, and it's in our own lives everywhere. Brokenness. The conflict that we see every single day is because of brokenness that comes from our sin. And most importantly, the conflict that is a broken relationship with God, which means what? We all deserve to spend eternity in hell because our relationship is broken with a perfect God by our imperfection, by our sin. And there's only one thing that can fix our brokenness, and that's the good news of the gospel, the fact that Jesus came and lived a perfect life in our place. And he died on the cross in our place. And he rose from the dead to defeat sin and death forever. So that now anyone who calls on his name, anyone who repents of their sin and believes in Jesus alone for forgiveness and salvation will receive that forgiveness. We can't earn it. We turn from sin and trust him. We believe in him and what he did on the cross. And that's the only way. That's the only way to be saved from brokenness now and brokenness for eternity. We're still broken, but we're being changed every day. That there, there's still conflict. Nobody's going to say, become a Christian, you won't have any conflict. No, of course, there's still conflict, but we can deal with it rightly. We can have hope, and we can have peace, and we can have contentment. So as Jesus changes your life, what happens? You begin to recover and to pursue that perfect plan and purpose that God has for your life, that design that is perfect in Christ only. Because not only do you have the promise of eternal life, but you have God in your life now to change you and to grow you 
through his Holy Spirit, that spirit who, who, who yearns jealously for your devotion and your worship. And so are you not only pursuing peace with God, but are you pursuing peace with others? Thinking about your conversations, your relationships, how to talk to people. Are you pursuing a right relationship with God, and are you pursuing that right relationship with others and for others, that they would walk with, with God? Disciples make disciples. And so who are you praying for today? Who are you growing with or growing alongside or, or, or asking for their help to help you grow? And what needs to change? What needs to change so that you are handling conflict in a way that helps you to seek God, that helps you to trust God, right? That helps you to obey his word. Father God, we pray for your help this morning, knowing that nothing we do, nothing we say can make us right with you. Nothing we do or say can make us perfect in our relationships because we're all sinners. And yet you sent Jesus to die for our sin, to rise from the dead, to win the victory over sin and death, to make a way for us to have a right relationship with you, but also knowing that a right relationship with you impacts our relationships with one another. And so that as we deal with conflict, all this conflict that is in the world because of, because of us and others not seeking you, us and others not obeying you, us and others not trusting you as we should, Father, help us to trust you. Help us to recognize that when we follow Jesus, he not only saves us from our sins, but he helps us in our everyday lives to live the life that you've called us to live. And that impacts our relationships. That, that helps us to deal with conflict. Father, help us to trust you more. And I pray for those who haven't yet surrendered their all to you, who haven't yet called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Holy Spirit, burden their hearts right now. Give them a desire to call, to call on your name. Help them to see that they can be right with you by simply asking you to forgive them and take over their life. Please draw them to yourself now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.